right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, and welcome, welcome to our fourth uh, Back to School with Diabetes. Um, I am so delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Kristen Castorino, and I work at Sanson Diabetes Research Institute in Santa Barbara, California, as a research physician. And I'm just so delighted to be a part of this incredible group of experts in all the wisdom, pearls, tips, and tricks for um, best way to navigate school, whether it's kindergarten or high school, um, even into college. Um, and so we're so happy that you're here. Um, I wanted to go a little, over, little housekeeping items. Um, this webinar will be an hour long. And we're going to try and cover as much as we possibly can during that hour. And I want to reassure everybody that this is recorded. And so if you want to go back and refer to something, um, you'll be able to, to refer to it. And we'll send you a link for the recording. And then we'll also be referring to resources, um, articles, and things like that. And you can also, we will send a, a, an email with the links to those or the actual articles themselves as, as appropriate. And so we're going to get you all the information. So don't worry about having to write everything down. Just open up and absorb. Um, so with that, um, let's go ahead and jump right in. And I would love for our incredible panelists. We don't, we, in the um, interest of time, we're, we don't have time to go over our, all of their incredible bios. And so I was going to ask the speakers if they could give a kind of a little quick pearl, quick summary of who they are and, and why they're here. Uh, so we'll start with, with Dr. Francine Kaufman. Well, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. And I'm thrilled to be here as well. And I'm sure we all are. Um, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And I've been in the field for almost 45 years. So I'm old and I'm very proud of it. Um, I have pretty much seen and done just about everything concerning diabetes and um, you know, gotten thousands of children from our center back to school. Um, I'm also the chief medical officer at Sensionics, the maker of the fully implanted sensor. And um, you know, just looking forward to always learning with all of you. Thank you so much. And now can I would love to hear about Crystal Woodward. Thank you, Dr. Castorino. And thanks, Samson and JDRF for partnering to offer this town hall again. I'm thrilled to be here. ADA is excited to be part of this once again. My name is Crystal Woodward. I'm the Managing Director of Legal Advocacy and Safe at School at the American Diabetes Association. I've been with the association in this capacity for now 24 years but I started my um, journey with ADA back in 1991 when my then one-year-old daughter was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So I too am a parent of a child with diabetes and I'm hoping that everyone will find tonight's information helpful and that there will be some key takeaways for you all. But thanks for joining us and I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Michael Harris. Uh, thanks very much. I'm excited to be here. My name is Michael Harris. I'm a pediatric psychologist by training with specialization in diabetes. I work at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. And um, I don't live with diabetes and no one in my family lives with diabetes. I was assigned uh, to Dr. Cindy Hansen as a graduate student and uh, just found it an incredible community, an incredible um, challenge that people meet successfully and it just blew me away and I never turned back. And so I've been doing this for about 35 years. Um, and uh, just in terms of uh, credibility, I have three kids. Um, they probably would tell you that I don't know anything about anything. Um, so, uh, you know, take that however you want, but I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. And Jacqueline Mc, McManaman? Yep. Hi there. I'm Jackie McManaman. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to be a part of this panel today. Um, I am a, a registered nurse as well as a diabetes care and education specialist. Um, and I work in uh, Fairfax County Health Department, which provides uh, school health services to Fairfax County Public Schools. 
So I have lots of school nursing experience. Um, I also volunteer on the Virginia Diabetes Council as the school chair. Um, and I volunteer on the ADA Safe at School Committee. Um, so I have a passion for diabetes, a passion for our students with diabetes and making sure that they are, you know, getting the best care that they can in the school setting and making sure we provide the best training as well. So thank you. Thanks so much, Jackie. And let's jump right in um, with our first question to uh, Dr. Kaufman. Um, what are the what are the basics for preparedness for going back to school? So it's a really collaborative effort between you as a parent, your children um, who are needing to have a diabetes medical management plan and a 504 plan um, developed by you and your healthcare provider. Um, and then really a collaborative effort with the school itself um, and with a goal that the school can provide trained staff who understand diabetes management, how to deliver insulin and glucagon and what these different factors do to glucose. Um, that there's trained staff as well for field trips and other activities. And that they allow really the capable student, old enough, trained enough, understanding enough, to really allow for self-management. So there are a number of meetings that you should take. Um, the first, obviously, is for the school to understand your child has type 1 diabetes, um, to get these two very important um, pieces of information, the diabetes medical management plan, so a meeting with your healthcare provider, so they understand what your goals are, what your child's capabilities are, what you would like done, what's independent that the child can do, what needs some supervision, or what they are completely dependent on the school, school personnel to do. And in that diabetes management plan is around, um, obviously, glucose levels, when they should be looked at when they should be addressed before meals, before exercise, after exercise, whatever you and your healthcare provider feel is the most important and effective way to manage your child's diabetes. Um, they need to understand what devices your child are use, is using um, from you know, blood glucose meters, uh, as well as CGM, and those CGM still need a backup blood glucose meter. Um, and a pump system that may be open loop or closed loop so that they understand exactly how your child manages their diabetes. You wanna be sure that everybody who comes in contact with your child is aware that they have diabetes and what some of um, the issues they could face are, you know, from the art teacher to the primary teacher um, to the PE teacher. I mean, everybody needs to understand that the child has diabetes. And um, you need to bring supplies, you need to um, you know, really coordinate this. Um, and the ADA and the JDRF have a number of resources that really enable you to be able to do this from a um, relative, you know, what the diabetes medical management plan should entail, and one that you could use yourself if your school system doesn't have one, to the 504 plan. Um, you know, to your responsibilities, the school's responsibilities, and obviously what you need also from your healthcare professionals. So it's a, um, it's a, it's not a daunting task. It's an important task. And you can all um, obviously accomplish this in a collaborative effort so that your child is as safe as possible in school. Um, and, you know, all the way from here's the regular management we're doing. If your child happens to be on a clinical trial, I know my center is doing a trial with inhaled insulin. The school needs to understand what that means. So whatever information that is relevant to your child's management needs to be shared as well. And, you know, after all these years and years and years of getting children back to school, I would say that it is um, really a very wonderful collaborative task where when it's done correctly, you can feel that you've really um, made a safe environment, a collaborative environment, um, and one in which your child can truly thrive. So we're you know, here to 
tell you, you know, how to get all this information, how to get all these resources, and um, really empower you to be able to do it. Thank you so much. It, it's a, um, it, it sounds like it can be complex, but it, it is a journey. It's not just a, you know, a, a one or two time thing. So, um, Speaking of the and journey, I, I do want to say just one of you know, and it needs to be refreshed. Obviously, if something significantly changes, so your child was on um, multiple daily injections, now they're on an insulin pump. Obviously, the school needs to be brought along, as the diabetes management is brought along as well. And you're right, all of diabetes is a journey. <laughs> Thank you so much. And speaking of that journey, uh, Crystal. What would you say to a family who feels like they don't really need a 504 plan? I build upon what Fran has already talked about in terms of the importance of both the diabetes medical management plan and the 504 plan. The American Diabetes Association recommends that every student with diabetes have a written accommodation plan. That could be in the form of a 504 plan, it could be in the form of an um, individualized education program or an IP for those students who qualify for services under a law called the Individuals with Disabilities and Education um, Act, or it could be simply just a written accommodations plan. But we do recommend a written accommodations plan for every student with diabetes. Um, and parents need to be proactive. Don't wait until there's a problem at school before you sit down with your 504 IEP team to develop the 504 plan. Get that plan developed, put it in writing while everything is going well. Um, there's no guarantee that that brilliant and compassionate school nurse is going to be on staff tomorrow or even that school principal who has a child with type 1 diabetes herself and really gets it, there's no guarantee that those staff members are going to be there tomorrow. So while everything is going well, get that plan, put it in writing. Um, sometimes I know schools are resistant to that for a variety of reasons. I don't hear that so much anymore as I did when I when I began this work with ADA, but I think with the little education and also really, again, that collaborative approach, how does having a 504 plan or another written plan um, support the health and safety of the child? And how is that plan in the best interest of school staff as well as the student? The plan is what sets out um, the responsibilities of staff, the responsibilities of parents, the responsibility of the student. Uh, as an example, what might be included in a 504 plan? Um, field trips, extracurricular activities, and who is responsible for providing care to your child during those excursions? It may be that your child is independent in his or her diabetes management, but every student, really every patient with diabetes is going to need help in the event of a hypoglycemic emergency. So we want to make sure in that plan that we've addressed who is going to be on that field trip. Um, think about what kinds of activities your child is planning to participate in during the school year. Um, are they on the varsity football team? Will they be in drama club? what types of after-school activities, uh, dance club. And then when you're writing the 504 with the, five, uh, with the 504 team, you, you can anticipate where the needs are, which staff persons are in place who could potentially provide care um, and, and memorialize that in the 504. And the 504 plan is where we see a, a requirement that the school provide trained non-clinical staff in those times when a school nurse is not on site, not available to provide care. That's a very important provision to write into the plan. Um, academic testing. We don't want our kids to take tests and high stakes standardized tests when blood glucose levels are out of target range. 
So we will address that in the 504 plan. Um, there is a sample plan by the American Diabetes Association that you can access. I think the uh, link is in the chat box, diabetes.org slash 504 plan. That's a great template. Um, that, it, that some of the provisions in that template plan may be, may be applicable to your child so you can pick and choose. But really, it is a collaboration with the school to sit down, decide what the needs of your child are and how those needs will be met. Be proactive, don't be reactive, and sit down with the school. If your child is newly diagnosed, you want to try to get that 504 plan in place before your child returns to school. Um, if your child is a returning student, many times the school team will sit down in the previous school year and write that plan so that there's not a mad rush to do so uh, when everybody returns to school in the summer. Um, if you have any questions about 504 plan, what should go in the plan, take a look at our plan online and you can also give us a call at 1-800-DIABETES or email askada at diabetes.org and we would be more than happy to provide you with information and guidance. Thank you so much. One, one very quick follow-up question. What ages is a 504 plan appropriate for? Well, so a 504 plan is developed for those children um, who attend a school, um, a public school receiving federal funds or a private school and, um, receiving federal funds, including religious schools. So it's not so much the age as where does your child go to school? So that could be um, a 504 plan could be put in place for pre-K. Um, 504 certainly should be put in place for elementary, for middle, for high schoolers. And then even in the post-secondary school setting, 504 in the Americans with Disabilities Act still offers legal protections to those post-secondary students. And usually rather than a 504 plan being developed, what will happen is the disability office at the post-secondary institution will work with the student. And notice I said student because most students attending post-secondary institutions are 18 years old. Um, so we'll work with the student to develop what's called letters of accommodation that the student can use to help the professors understand diabetes and also understand what possible accommodations are needed in that post-secondary environment. Again, um, go to ADA's website, give us a call if you'd like more information. Thank you so much. And now I wanted to ask um, Michael Harris, how can we help a child maintain a sense of normalcy in their life despite the challenges posed by diabetes? Specifically, in school, how can students communicate with their teachers and school staff about their diabetes needs without feeling overwhelmed or embarrassed? Great. So I do want to uh, respond if it's okay to the 504 issue really quickly. Um, one thing people need to appreciate is that an IEP is not a 504. Uh, and so an IEP is an individualized education plan, which is separate from a 504. A 504 is specifically for children with other health needs that are separate from learning challenges. And so you don't want to get confused. Like if you think your if your child has an IEP, it's not a 504. Those are two very different things. And so um, your child may have a learning challenge and be getting some sort of accommodations for dyslexia or whatever. That's not a 504. And so you also need to have a 504 in place. The second thing is about you know, ownership over this process. I would say that all the healthcare providers on this call would probably agree that the, cent the diabetes centers from which you're getting your care are part of the team that should be helping to advocate on behalf of your child. And so you don't have to do this alone. In our center, our diabetes educators, our endocrinologists, our psychologists, our social workers, our dietitians, all are going to support you. And so lean on us because uh, we speak the same language, but with a different voice. And so schools may respond differently to um, the same message, but from a different voice. 
So the question was, was about a sense of normalcy, which is different from kind of entering into school. Um, I don't know how anyone could live with diabetes and have a sense of normalcy, to be honest with you. So I don't have an answer for that, frankly, because um, you know, we're asking people to do the impossible, which is to manage um, to, to run your pancreas from outside your body, which is just a feat in and of itself. Um, and there's nothing normal about that. And it can be overwhelming. Um, there's obviously things you can do to, to decrease the impact on that. But um, the goal is really to, to increase quality of life or maintain quality of life despite having to, to meet these incredible challenges of, of living with diabetes. When it comes to school, um, you know, the, the approach we, that I would use is there's negotiables and non-negotiables. This is just a tried and true parenting approach, but the non-negotiable is the school needs to know about your diabetes. Uh, the negotiable is who tells and what gets told. And so this gives um, young people a chance to kind of advocate on their own behalf if they want to, or have their parents advocate on their behalf. Uh, and then it ne really needs to be really clear from your child as to um, what accommodations may be causing more distress uh, than helping. And a, a really simple example, which I hear all the time, is that young people get excused five minutes early before lunch to go take their insulin in the office. Well, this sounds like a really cool thing. Um, it's really not. Uh, it can be really disruptive to their social life. It can be disruptive to lunch, depending on how busy the office is. They get back, they have a very limited amount of time for lunch. They miss that. They miss all the socialization during lunch. Um, and then they miss potentially five minutes of very important material in school, in the class. So um, once again, I think thinking outside the box about the best way to maximize the child's experience at school and academic experience first, while also taking care of their diabetes. And there's a ton of workarounds. Um, I can't give you one specific example, to be honest with you, because each person is different, each school is different. Um, the administration is different at each school, which requires kind of a collaborative thinking approach where you include, like I said, endocrinologists, psychologists, whoever's part of your care team in trying to figure out the best way to, to keep the child in school, being successful, having all the other opportunities that the other children have, um, and not thinking that these shortcuts are kind of the answer uh, when they once again could be causing more distress. That's all I got. That was wonderful. That, well said, thank you so much. Um, and to, to Jackie, um, what, do you, what advice do you have about how to best communicate with the school staff, including teachers, resource specialist aides, coaches? Um, what do you recommend? Yeah, thank you. I, I think this is such an important question and I think we've talked about it quite a bit. Um, a good place to start is finding out which, what particular forms or doctor's orders or healthcare provider orders that are required for your school district. Um, I know in our county, we utilize the ADA's Diabetes Medical Management Plan, um, which is that collaborative document that is completed by the parent as well as the diabetes healthcare provider. Um, and this form, you know, includes all of those important details, such as, you know, the student self-care skills, um, CGM monitoring, low glucose treatment and prevention, hyperglycemia treatment, insulin dosing, just to name a few. But once the parent has that form um, that's required by the school, the parent should reach out to the school nurse uh, to set up that meeting to review the diabetes medical management plan and then discuss those school protocols and procedures as it relates to diabetes. Um, the school nurse is often you know, the staff member responsible in the school to then notify pertinent school staff and provide any training that the um, you know, child's diabetes needs are for the school day. So the school nurse is kind of that essential staff member to be communicating those diabetes management needs with, and then he or she can then communicate that out to your school staff. 
certainly the parent can communicate with the teacher, with um, any of the child's coaches and, um, you know, any of those specialists, but the school nurse often acts as the facilitator for that. Um, and, and, you know, when we do trainings here in our county, we include the cafeteria staff as well as the bus drivers. Those are some important staff members that we can sometimes forget about communicating with, um, but are obviously an essential part of that student school day. Um, so yeah, so the communication really comes down to knowing what kind of orders you need so that the school can take care of your student and then finding that essential staff member in your school to help you kind of navigate all those ins and outs and, and getting that communication to trickle out. Um, and I'll just, I'll add to just about the 504, um, the school nurse is often the one who recommends it, or at least a lot of the conversations I have with parents is, hey, now we need to talk about a 504 plan. Um, and so I think that that is another staff member who you can lean on to help facilitate that process for you, um, who is always looking to advocate for students. So we make sure we get those 504 plans in place as, as fast as we can, or at least get the ball rolling, um, especially during these busy couple weeks before the school year has started. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's how I would go about getting those communication needs met. Thank you so much. And um, I wanna uh, ask Dr. Kaufman, what advice you have about um, hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic emergencies at school and add on, it, are, the, are these still ap applicable with AP systems or the closed loop um, insulin delivery systems? Well, I think the good news for all of us is, is that diabetes management overall is so much better than it was in the past. And part of that is technology, improved insulins, I think our ability to, um, you know, really have education materials that are much better and much more targeted towards children. And I think, um, you know, over the years, a, a much improved acceptance of diabetes in the school itself. Um, there are always potentially still going to be emergencies and the hypoglycemic emergencies, um, you know, there, there are good materials to discuss and you can individualize those as well as what does my child experience usually on their way to becoming hypoglycemic and, um, and then what the treatment should be. Is it before lunch? Is it after lunch? Is it in the middle of the afternoon? Is it before physical activity? So most of these diabetes medical management plans allow for some individualization, particularly as to what might be, a, you know, the treatment regimen before physical activity and before PE, which might mean that they have to sit out of PE for a little bit until the glucose recovers. Um, there obviously should be glucagon in the school. Um, I think the good news is the nasal glucagon is a little bit more accepted. The already solubilized glucagon, a little bit easier to use. And in all the years you know, that I've given my patients glucagon, which is every one of them, um, it is used very, very, very rarely, but obviously an important intervention when required. For diabetic ketoacidosis, a little bit more on that evolution. It takes a little bit more time. Um, you know, this is where monitoring of the glucose, allowing the child to feel comfortable and talking about any symptoms they may have. Um, and, you know, and then really being able to address it early. Um, you know, compared to later, including, um, you know, having ketone strips available um, at the school itself. But, you know, the big, I think, unknown still a little bit is um, most of the children are going to have CGM. And what a difference CGM has made, I think, in all of their lives and our lives as healthcare providers and parents and families um, as well. And the big question is, who's going to be following that? What is a communication pathway? And I think we're still evolving, but the most ideal is obviously that the parent or parents or even grandparents are following the CGM data, um, that they have the ability to communicate 
either with the child directly or with um, you know, the health aide, the school nurse, even um, you know, somebody else in the school who is helping with the diabetes management, that there's a you know, low glucose value that's occurring, there's a high glucose value, and um, you know, these parameters are likely needing to be individualized depending on um, you know, how long the child's had diabetes, how old they are, what their symptomatology might be. There are some schools who will follow the school nurse or uh, the health aide will follow also um, on their phone, the CGM. I, you know, I, I don't, um, you know, by no means is that universal. There are some schools and I know some of my patients are being followed by school personnel when they're there. Um, and, uh, you know, it all depends, but it is another very important parameter that, you know, if you have a CGM, you should be following your child and working out um, on that medical management plan, how to communicate if there are glucose values that you're concerned about, either directly to the child or to somebody in the school. Thank you so much. And um, this question is for Crystal. Um, how, how will the student's attendance and participation in physical education, field trips, other extracurricular activities, how are, the, how are those accommodations um, look like when considering diabetes management and inclusivity? Sure. sure. Well, I had mentioned um, previously that at the beginning of the school year, uh, to the extent possible, it's helpful for the parent to try to map out which activities the child might be participating in during the school year, whether it's you know, cheerleading or a club, um, certainly all students are going to go on field trips, all students are going to attend assemblies, all you know, elementary school students are going to be out on the playground. Um, and the reason why that's important is that it's, we want to make sure that the clinical, the non-clinical school staff who will be responsible for these students um, has been trained. Um, for the more independent student, we want to make sure that those staff who interface and are responsible for that student know how to recognize hypoglycemia and know how to respond. Um, know that it is the school's responsibility under federal laws, Section 504, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and many state laws to provide either a school nurse or trained non-clinical staff to be present at these events. Um, you know, with a field trip, normally what I see is that a teacher will provide the school nurse and the parent with at least two weeks notice of a field trip, and then a plan will be worked out as to who's going to attend that field trip. I, um, I always talk about when my own daughter was in uh, Virginia schools, one of the things our county did was they, um, they trained all of the bus drivers in glucagon administration. And I know that is, has become a fairly common practice in, in many parts of the country, but I thought that was smart. That way, when the students with diabetes go on a field trip with the teachers, and, and then the bus drivers know how to uh, recognize and respond to hypoglycemia, if the child's independent, may not need someone there to give insulin or to help with the slight change, right? But um, it is the school's responsibility to provide that care. If, if your child is in sports, many times the athletic trainers are already trained um, at a minimum to recognize and respond to hypoglycemia. Many times the coaches are um, trained to respond to hypoglycemia. Also know that the American Diabetes Association has many training materials that are available for your school nurse, are available for diabetes educators to help them to train those non-clinical non school staff members who will be caring for your child. And all of this should be memorialized in the 504 plan or the IEP or other written accommodations plan. And again, if you have any questions, um, give ADA a call. Thank you so much. And I've uh, this is for any of the panelists 
what if, you know, some of the schools, um, parents have reached out, but they're just, they're, they kind of are closed for the summer or the, there's limited staffing and they, and, and so they say we can't start on a 504 right now. Um, what can parents do? Well, there are schools that a lot of schools are closed right now and they're, you know, they're not working on 504 plans and, and reviewing DMMPs to so find out when staff will be back and reach out to staff, reach out to your school nurse, reach out to your school's 504 coordinator and set up a time to meet um, just as soon as possible. You may not have a 504 plan or an IEP on the first day your child returns to school and that's okay, that's okay. Um, it is a process and it's a process for a reason. We want to make sure that the plan um, contains accommodations to meet your child's needs and is individualized for each child. In under section 504 regulations and the Americans with Disabilities Act regulations, individual assessment is required for each child. And then the plans are developed based on that individual assessment and also um, the provider's orders contained in the diabetes medical management plan. I would say to get in touch with your healthcare provider, at least on the diabetes medical management plan, as, as soon as you can. I'm at my center, we've got thousands of children, and you know, it is a, a very large group effort. And of course, we want to make those plans concordant with what you as the parents and the child really want as well. So um, you know, you can you can get those on the way, and then when you can meet with the school, go over um, you know, in detail, but the sooner you can work on that for sure, um, the better. Thank you so much. Um, and now I wanted to ask um, Michael about, you know, looking in, in trying to tease out or, or identify specific signs or symptoms that may um, indicate that your child is experiencing emotional distress and related to their diabetes. Are there any Anything that parents should be looking for or? So sure, um, I, I would expect that every child, uh, every adult, uh, young person living with uh, diabetes goes through uh, various periods of distress around their emotional distress around managing diabetes. It could cycle from day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. So um, be prepared that there is no specific pattern. There may be one day where a child's really overwhelmed by um, living with and managing their diabetes and other times where they, uh, they feel like they've got it. The thing you wanna look for are what we call behavioral excesses and behavioral deficits. So significant changes either in one direction or the other um, that is uh, different from how your child normally functions and how they normally are and specifically around their diabetes management is the way I'd look at it. Um, I, I tell a story that uh, scares endocrinologists a lot, but uh, it's, an ad, it's a story that helps people understand kind of the, the series of burnouts that people go through with diabetes. And basically they're taking a vacation from their diabetes. Um, they're, when we're on vacation, um, I'm on vacation right now. It doesn't mean I'm completely away from work. Obviously I'm here working. Uh, it doesn't mean they've abandoned um, all their diabetes management, but they've backed away significantly. And so when you start to see that, really call it out as it is. Um, they're taking a vacation from their diabetes and we need to kind of define it, uh, have a beginning and an ending. Uh, and we wanna know at what point do we know that the, that the, uh, the vacation is gonna be over and when the vacation is going on, how can parents, how can others that are involved in that young person's life support diabetes so the child doesn't feel like they have to take it all on. You know, there's, um, I see every child in our institution who's a new onset um, at diagnosis in the hospital. And one of the things I talk about is this idea of interdependence. So a lot of parents are very anxious for a child to become fully independent with their diabetes. And I get that, although I don't have a child with diabetes, I could see that push to have them be able to manage their diabetes independently. Um, that makes a lot of sense intuitively, but what this does is it, it puts the child in a very awkward position of having to manage something that really no one person can manage independently, no matter how bright or capable they are. 
And so talking about the idea of interdependence and moving towards periods where you're doing more or less and people around you are doing more or less. So it's the idea is to configure your social support network in a way that you don't have to do everything all the time. And then there are other times where you probably would prefer to do it. So um, that's usually how I handle kind of emotional distress around diabetes or, or what we would call diabetes burnout. Thank you so much. And do you have any recommendations on family-based or individual-based support for ongoing type one diabetes? Yeah, so um, the model that I co-developed with uh, another psychologist, Tim Waisaki, is called Behavioral Family Systems Therapy for Diabetes. It's probably the, the uh, most well-published and validated intervention for young people living with diabetes. If you can find somebody who is a diabetes psychologist, social worker, counselor, who may have access to um, the materials for this intervention, I think that that's really the best way to do it. It's not really a psychotherapeutic intervention. It's more of a skills-based intervention, and it's focused on problem solving and communication skills training. So how as a family, do we problem solve and communicate around this very challenging condition um, and work collaboratively, basically? So if you hear bu buzzwords like collaborative problem, problem solving in your counselor, that would be, um, that would be someone who I, I consider seeing. Somebody asked what the intervention was called. It's called Behavioral Family Systems Intervention, BFST, Behavioral Family Systems Treatment. Thank you so much. I, uh, can I just add one more piece? Please, please. Um, I don't think I've seen a young person alone, um, but maybe a handful of times in my entire career. Uh, the, the message we send young people is that diabetes is a team sport. And so there's no value in me working with a young person alone if the message is this is a team sport. And so um, if you consider uh, taking your child to a, a psychologist, a social worker, a counselor around the issue of diabetes, I would consider it a family um, event. I would include siblings as well. They have a role in supporting that child um, and others, grandparents who maybe live with the family or are involved in the child's life quite a bit. Um, it really sends a very strong message that you don't do this by yourself and that's not the expectation and you've got a ton of support behind you and that's how we're going to do this. Cool. Thank you so much. And um, this question is for Jackie. Uh, what training do you recommend providing to school staff about type 1 diabetes and how to support the students' needs? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the lots and lots of training um, is what is needed to so that someone can take care of a student with diabetes. And um, the American Diabetes Association, a Safe at School website, has um, wonderful diabetes training modules that are available as both PowerPoint slides and um, videos so that staff can watch the, the modules kind of specific to the student. You know, there's hypo, hyperglycemia, there's a module about the DMMP, there's modules about um, glucagon, insulin, um, insulin by pen, syringe, pump. So there's, there's I think it's 18 or 19 um, modules available um, for, for training. And um, here in our county, we use three levels of training for diabetes, and we use the ADA modules for those levels of training. And, and how we break it down is with level one training is, um, and this is mandated by our state to provide these three levels of training, um, but how we provide them level one is uh, just basics and it's about 20 to 30 minutes long and it's for the entire school campus to view. So everyone in the school building has to view this training. And then level two training is um, for all classroom teachers and staff members who are in contact with the student with diabetes. So this includes all the specialists, you know, music teacher, art teacher, um, cafeteria staff, bus drivers, everyone who comes in contact with the student with diabetes. And then level three training is for those staff members who are going to administer insulin and glucagon. And um, in our state, we have to have a minimum of three staff members trained in level three. 
Often we uh, train much more than that, but that is a, is legislated by the state that we have that minimum requirement. Um, and the level three trained staff, you know, they're the ones who are going to um, be able to perform, you know, insulin administration with the student on a field trip, or it's the athletic trainer during, or the coach during the football games, or, um, you know, the bus driver in the event the student needs glucagon. Um, so these are our level three trained staff. Now, I know someone asked, well, what happens if you don't have a school nurse in your school? A lot of states don't have school nurses at every school site. They will often have a school nurse who serves several sites, which is what we have here in my county as well. And um, so we are able to delegate that um, those skills after we provide the training to those staff members, the unlicensed staff members to be able to perform the care. Um, and again, we use the ADA modules to do the didactic training. So kind of the e-learning component. And then we provide an in-person component, which is more specific to the student skills. For example, their brand of insulin pump, their type of insulin pen, their type of glucometer, CGM. Um, so more of those hands-on skills are done in person. Um, in, in total, our state requires a minimum of four hours of training for um, students with diabetes, for staff to attend uh, four hours of training. So lots of training, um, but it's so valuable. And some um, states may not, again, have school nurses readily available to do the training. And so in that case, you can partner with, you know, um, your pediatric endocrine providers in the area. I know even in the state of Virginia, we have pediatric practices that provide education for schools. Um, so that's another avenue that you can explore for um, training. And I see Katie shared the training resources for ADA in the chat. So please check those out. Um, they really are a great, great option. Thank you so much. And I, I see we're, we're, we've got about 12 minutes left. We're going to, we're going to try and end on time, but we want to get as many questions answered as possible. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kaufman if you could give us a quick overview on the latest, greatest technologies um, that, that can help um, free students' minds so they can focus on, on school and friends and all the other fun stuff. Well, you know, this is very individualized. Um, it's very different for somebody who is um, younger, new onset, um, or doing, you know, incredibly uh, well with what they have. It doesn't mean we need to to switch somebody. But obviously, in the last um, number of years, we've seen a tremendous evolution of uh, particularly automated mm -hmm. insulin delivery devices. So a CGM, an algorithm that then takes that CGM data and enables a pump to modulate particularly basal insulin delivery. And if you look at the overall research data with those, as well as real world evidence now that so many individuals are using these, that um, you know, they have been able to reduce hypoglycemia and prove A1C, um, you know, reduce episodes of diabetic ketoacidosis. So um, you know, maybe that's the pen ultimate. Um, technology that's available. There's a lot of other, um, you know, ways. CGM itself, I think, is um, so valuable. Um, and, and, you know, certainly the recommendation from the ADA standards of care, as well as the pediatric organizations, is to have as many children as possible um, with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, particularly if they're taking insulin on CGM. CGM allows for the alarms to occur. Um, in the classroom so that the teacher can hear. Now this may be, you know, Michael might need to help us understand how um, the children can best deal with some of those alarms, but, um, you know, they, they do allow for um, trending towards hypo or hyperglycemia or at hypo or hyperglycemic levels to be alarmed. Um, you know, again, people can remotely follow that. So, um, you know, again, there's some schools where the school nurse is following on, on um, her device, their parents, if they can, they're following on their devices as well. So um, CGM, the automated insulin delivery devices, 
um, you know, lots of technology that's out there to improve um, overall glucose diabetes management, which as time has gone on, I think has been something that, you know, has made a big advantage for the kids so that they can focus more and more. Of course, they've got to live with the devices, they got to manage the devices, they got to answer questions about the devices. But with, you know, better diabetes management, it does hopefully free them up to, um, you know, have more time for educational opportunities and social opportunities and all the other opportunities. I will say, you know, over the years, the children who um, don't want to hide their diabetes, who are, you know, more matter of fact about it, it's my diabetes, it's my glucose monitor, it's my CGM, um, and, you know, kind of explain it to their peers or um, their, you know, their parents help explain it or the teachers help explain it. Um, when it's more out in the open, um, it works, I think, best, um, kind of, you know, defocuses it on something that's so, you know, different and focuses it more on something, well, that, you know, you've got whatever you've got, I've got this, this is, you know, really helping me manage my diabetes. And, um, you know, and there's, it, it's normalized. I mean, I think that's, you know, how, however we can help our children feel that, um, I really do think it ends up with the best outcome. I want to comment on what Dr. Kaufman just said and just highlight that because that is so important. When I see a young person at diagnosis in the hospital, the first thing I, well, one of the first things I ask is, do your friends know you're here and do they know why? And talk about the importance of being public and not feeling shame because that being public about diabetes is really going to be your friend in the long run. If you're constantly trying to hide it, you're embarrassed by it. Um, that's going to cause a lot of problems, especially going to school where you're in a very public place, but you're also having to manage a very private thing. So that's, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's just a really important piece of, of successful diabetes management, just in life, but also at school is um, getting young people comfortable with being public about living with diabetes. That'll solve a lot of the problems right there. And that actually was a little relating to my next question for you, Michael, is for um, kids or adolescents or teens dealing with be being bullied or re with regard to their diabetes or devices um, or shame is coming up, what what recommendations you have do you have to help build resilience? Yeah, so um, it's interesting because uh, one of the places that um, potentially someone is going to build resilience is a place that they're potentially resistant to, and that is this idea of engaging in the diabetes community because people who are wanting to hide it are ashamed of it, potentially getting bullied around it. They're not going to want to engage in more public um, diabetes, um, the, the more public diabetes community like Jade or F Walk, uh, ADA, Bolathons, the diabetes camps, anything where they're exposed to um, other young people living with diabetes where the focus isn't on diabetes, it's just on being uh, a young person in a family. Um, I tell young people about that diabetes camp is the one place that you're not a diabetic. And they kind of think and they go, why, you know, I don't get it. And they said, well, you're a camper. Every other camp you go to, you're the diabetic. You get pulled aside, um, you get focused on. And so part of building resilience is the, probably the most powerful piece is social support and engaging in activities with other people who share that. I would say that the online diabetes community is incredible. Um, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, the parents are gonna hate me for this. And they always do when I say, you know, you should get on social media with the diabetes community because it's just an incredible community. There's a lot of young people on there. They're very creative. There's young people doing raps about pumps and closed loop systems. There's, it's, it's just giving, you know, this thing that is really, can be really challenging and a burden much of the time, some other side to it that is a little bit lighter, um, a little bit more fun, engaging. And that balance really drives resilience. I'd say the last thing is, is the one thing that we don't trust um, 
enough in is our children's ability to be resilient. Um, most of the, the families that I see, the parents struggle way more than the kids. And kids only do as good as we do as parents. We model coping, we model how we handle everything. And so if a, if a parent is not handling their child's diabetes well, that eventually is gonna seep into and um, impact the child negatively. So one of the most powerful tools we have in front of us is modeling. So model the things that you wanna see in your child, even if they're resistant to some of the, the things like going to a diabetes walk or whatever it is. Um, so just participating in this event is actually one of the ways to build resilience, um, to build a positive self-image while also living with diabetes. Thank you so much. And I just, you know, as we have all of you attendees here, I wanted to remind, um, let you all know that we will send a link to this presentation, um, as well as, um, all, as all the resources and probably some extras um, to, to when you registered, we've got your email so we can send that out to you. So this is not, you can refer back to it. Um, and before we go, um, and I wanted to offer our panelists a, a chance to have, if you wanted to have any other final remarks or feel things that you felt like didn't get said that need to be mentioned. I know we could probably be here for the, all night and into the next week. Um, so, but I wanted to see if, if there's anything that must be mentioned. I, I just want to share that um, I don't see as much as I'd like to see in, I, uh, in parents and in families um, of young people living with diabetes, them giving themselves some grace. They're, they put the hot bar really, really high. And I have to remind them once again that they're doing the incredible, they're doing the impossible, um, but the standard is so high, which then also kind of gets message to the child that the standard is, you know, time in range 80% or whatever that is. Um, and so just once again, showing up your 80% success right there and continuing to engage, continue to focus on the behaviors of good health versus the outcomes of good health. The behaviors will eventually get you to the outcomes, but there will, no, there will not be in type one diabetes an immediate response between the behaviors and the outcomes. Those are tend to be delayed. And so just showing yourself some grace, um, appreciating that this is a journey like Dr. Um, Kaufman alluded to and that uh, you know we're all on it with you. And so lean on us as well. Yeah, and I, I would just like to, to add, um, you know, our children are children first. Um, and, you know, that's really important. And being successful in school. So if there's something they love, uh, they love band, they love uh, cooking, whatever it is. I mean, to encourage what they feel good about and, um, you know, enable them to have the activities they want to have. And, um, you know, no, no number in and of itself is bad. Um, it's an overall, you know, working towards as healthy a lifestyle as possible, including the diabetes ma management aspects. But, you know, I often see, you know, what happened here? Why did that occur? What did you do? And just to, you know, say, you know, recognize, oh, there was a little bit of hyperglycemia. Uh, you know, how can we work on this? Um, you know, collaboratively together, um, use your healthcare providers and, you know, give yourself and, and your family a break. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think having, you know, that good communication with your school team is so important too. Um, you know, opening those lines of communication with the school and getting that diabetes medical management plan so that the needs of your child can be clearly communicated with the school. Um, and working with, you know, the staff members at the school who are going to take care of your student um, to make sure that there is just a safe, a safe plan in place. Um, and one thing I'll mention, too, is, you know, it's important to just check out uh, ADA's website, like we've been saying, um, but to think through, you know, fire drills, evacuations, lockdowns, getting supplies into different parts of the school is very important into, um, you know, a go bag for emergency type of, you know, responses where maybe we have to evacuate the school and go to an alternate site. Um, all of those type of conversations, although aren't always pleasant, are really important to have um, with your school team 
when you're um, when you're planning for your student to go to school. So thank you. I want to build on what Jackie said. Um, education, education, education. Um, there are many schools still out there who don't understand diabetes. They're afraid of diabetes. They don't understand their legal responsibilities under federal and state law. And I encourage parents to become familiar with your state law, with federal law. Again, go to ADA's website, lots of good information about legal protections. And also provide, work with your school nurse and provide, be a resource yourself. You can help educate school staff about diabetes and share the ADA's materials. Those materials, materials were developed by um, pediatric diabetes providers across the country and they're there for your use, for your school use and for your provider's use. So education is the key as we're returning to the classroom this fall. Thank you so much. And I, I'm gonna try and squeeze in one more question that came up in the chat. Um, you know, I, I, I think it was Dr. Kaufman that said earlier that we're, we're navigate, navigating new technology and how, how do, do the laws apply to new technology? And so one of the questions came up is, was from a nurse who said that her school, she was following kids and her district or, or someone um, said that it was a liability and that, that she shouldn't be able to follow. Do, do any of our panelists have any, can, can any of you weigh in on this? You know, I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm in the state of California and we seem to, um, at least my patients and what I'm hearing um, have the ability whether it's you know a dedicated device that the you know somebody in the school has during the school hours to to follow on, but you know it's back to where we were a long time ago with every new piece of technology where people feel it's you know too much. I remember when insulin pumps first came, we couldn't get them in the school. I actually did a study about could we use the insulin pump at nighttime only and take it off before the kids went to school and put it back on when they came back. And you know it 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 is I think what we see with every new technology it takes time it takes our education I think Crystal's really right it takes you know involving your healthcare provider as to what the advantages are talking to the right people to say you know if, if anything this is a reduction in liability you know you've got more information it's safer for the child so um, but it but it's what we see at every new innovation it takes a while for um, everybody to feel comfortable, including the school. I think Thank I'll you. add to that. I, yeah. oh, sorry, uh, Kristen, I, I was just gonna add to that. I think, you know, some of, here in my county, we have multiple students with diabetes in, in our school, on our school site. So we're not talking just one student, we're talking many. Um, and so many schools are quite large. So a thousand plus students, some campuses with, you know, 2,000 students, depending on the, the grade level, or depending on whether it's a secondary school or an elementary school. Um, and that being said, I think that it, it needs to be a conversation with, at the individual school level, with what, what that school can provide, um, can safely provide, in addition to making sure that staff understand how to respond to those alarms appropriately, make sure that the CGM alarms are set appropriately so that staff can respond. Um, and, and so that we're not, you know, causing the student to have lots of missed class time as it relates to their CGM. Because again, we want them to still be kids enjoying the classroom just like everyone else and not constantly being pulled out of class related to a CGM dip or, um, you know, something that's maybe not Need, doesn't need an intervention right at that second. So I think it comes back to what Dr. Kaufman and Crystal have been saying with education and making sure that we're educating people around CGMs. Um, and I think, you know, it's it also depends on the, the individual school systems policies, as well as the state policies around that. Right. Well, um, we're we are past that past the hour. So I wanted to thank our incredible panelists um, for all of your wisdom and insight today. And I just 
Uh, wanted to re remind our listeners that this is an educational forum and not medical advice. As you heard today, there's there this is so much an individual, you know, everyone is different. Um, no one is the same and there is no one size fits all. Um, and I just am so grateful for this community um, and this village that we can all work together um, to improve the lives of, of students with type one diabetes. So thank you all so much for being here. And with that, we will, we will say until next time. <laughs>